Welcome to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bonneau, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go. So today, our guest is Ken Coleman, Vice President of Yarbo an innovative technology company based in New York that launched the world's first autonomous snow removal robot. Let's start with a bit of background. Ken, thank you for making the time. And uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about, about yourself and how did you get to start your company? Sure. Yeah, sure. So, um, so my background really was originally in marketing. So I did that for about nine years and then I had for a company and then I had started my own marketing company. From there, I had that for about 12 years. And then I eventually started a Husqvarna dealership. So it specialized in autonomous uh, lawnmowers and battery operated equipment. And from there, I just kind of always had the feel, I've always been into technology. And so I've, I mean, to, to a fault in a way, uh, if I can integrate technology into it, I want to, but really, really it's become now with a family and time and everything, it's really become any way that I could save time and, you know, spend it with my family or, you know, doing things we love to do rather than cutting the lawn or mowing the grass or removing snow, you know, that's kind of what we prefer. So that's really where it came from and and running the dealership, we specialized in one particular brand and that brand of of automower requires like a a wire to be buried in the ground. And to me, that was always kind of an antiquated way of doing things. We did, when we decided to start Yarbo, we really wanted an all-in-one yard solution, right? So a modular platform that could not just do snow removal, which is definitely a cool thing because it's a world first, but also managing the lawn, and managing, you know, the leaves. And that's that's really just the beginning since it's a modular platform. So what Yarbo can do today, it'll be able to do many, many more things, you know, the following year and the year after that and years to come. Um, and you started with the snowboat and then yep. you actually effectively rebranded the whole company to Yarbo. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because I deal with um, naming and branding and domain names. And oftentimes I see entrepreneurs who sort of lock themselves into one particular industry yeah, yeah, yeah. or product exactly with their exactly. name, which is kind of what happened with you. So how, how did that process go? Yeah. So we had Snowbot for five years and what ended up happening was we hit this crossroads where we had probably five or six revisions of Snowbot. We were getting really close to, to actually pushing it out to retail. And we got so far along in the process that certain things happened along the way. One was that we realized, okay, if we can navigate in the snow, that's Mm. really the most difficult thing to do, right? So to be able to attach a lawnmower or a leaf blower or any other module to the front, the brains of the operation is really the main body. And we really felt like at that point, the product would really be kind of pigeonholing us or, or keeping us in one specific niche. And, and so would the name, right? Snowbot. So debated about having Snowbot and then, you know, maybe Yardbot and, you know, different names for each attachment. But we really wanted unified branding and we wanted it to convey that, you know, it, it will handle anything in your yard. We still wanted it to be mm-hmm. two syllables. You know, that's one of the reasons we went with Yarbo. We wanted it to be short, memorable. So, yeah, that that was a big thing because even now, it's very hard to convey in, in a simple, concise way everything that Yarbo can do, from towing attachments to all the modules that are coming down the line. You know, we wanted we wanted it to be focused enough that you know very quickly Yarbo, okay, you know, yard robot, but mm-hmm. um, but that it's you know it, it's very versatile uh, instead mm-hmm. of just the snowbot or even then unique names for each would kind of just confuse things a little more. We thought. No, I absolutely agree with that. And I, I love the name, actually. I, I know, um, obviously, there's a lot of value in dictionary words as brand names and a lot of advantages that come with that. But also, I see it. I love names like that because it yeah. really does communicate what you do. It doesn't limit you in any way, but it also is unique. Like there's no other brand that's called that. So that's just great in terms of uh, marketing and in terms of uniqueness. And even when you go into trademarks, et cetera, I think that's very useful as well. 
Yeah, no, yeah, it really, it helped us out big time there. And then that was a, a premium domain that we had to purchase, but well, well worth the investment. Um, well worth the investment. It's, I mean, really, obviously it's our name, so it's everywhere. Mm. And so, yeah, no, that was, that was huge for us. And you had with the Snowboat, you, you actually had this snowboat.com as a domain name. Correct. So with Yarbo, you went with just Yarbo.com, not the Yarbo, Yarbo dot something else. Yeah, we, we were in our marketing. We're really trying our branding. We're really trying to convey the Yarbo as almost like a yard assistant, right? So mm-hmm. instead of the Yarbo, it's really what Yarbo can do for you. Instead of mm-hmm. the Yarbo being more like product oriented, more of a, you know, more of a thing than a companion. So in the future, kind of envision, again, you can ask Google to have Yarbo clean the yard or whatever it may be. That's one of the reasons we, with intention, drop the, the right? So mm-hmm. we want things to be like, this is what Yarbo can do for you. You can ask Yarbo to mow the lawn, right? Through Google, Alexa, you know, Siri. But we didn't want it to be such a stationary type of object, a static object like your, you know, like the lawnmower you have, right? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. That kind of a thing. Great. And is that something, where are you in terms of development at the moment? Like, is that, you're talking about uh, it can do this and it can do that and you can tell it yes. what to do with Alexa, et cetera. That's all there, done, you're doing. Yeah, so, yeah, so the way we, we're rolling this out, right now there's a Kickstarter campaign going on. We're a little bit unique in that some companies do Kickstarter to get to a production stage, uh, to get funding for production. But the Yarbo is already in production. So really, we did it for brand awareness and marketing awareness. To get, and because our goal is really to kind of disrupt you know, the traditional yard care model, right? Mm-hmm. So because people have tried just to break into just the lawn care aspect, and like Husqvarna did, has done a, you know, an okay job of that, but we really want to disrupt the entire yard care market. So whether you're maintaining your lawn, cutting it, or whether you need to aerate it, dethatch it, whether you want to use a vacuum to suck up leaves, could be a myriad of things, but we really want to help in all parts of yard care. So basically, right now, the Kickstarter is, is live. It's in mass production, but we're doing a staggered rollout. Because the, the, the S1, the Snowbot, S1 module is basically like the, the, the original Snowbot we had in development for five years, that's already ready to go. So, or that is ready to go, I should say. The M1, which is the lawnmower, is shipping in the springtime. And a month after that, the blower is shipping because we didn't a lot of, and again, on Kickstarter, a lot of times people will obviously kind of over promise and under deliver, especially with the timelines. So we wanted to be realistic in what we knew we could handle. And we also wanted enough time. We have a functional lawnmower right now module and a functional blower, but we know that they can be better than they are. We don't want, you know, a, a great snow blower and a mediocre lawnmower and a mm-hmm. mediocre blower. So we're really taking the next couple of months after the snowblower launches and fine tuning, you know, the, the lawnmower to be the best lawnmower. It can be not just a generic, you know, kind of slap on module. So. Mm. So your Kickstarter, I looked at it, it, it looks like a huge success. And I mean, how did you, do you have a Facebook group as well? How did you do that? Obviously, I'm sure you can't like tell me all about it, but what's you yeah, yeah. share about? No, I can, yeah, I can give you the kind of us. Uh, high level overview, let's call it, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's and this is nothing unique in the industry, right? So basically, obviously, it requires a lot of advertising before the campaign itself even goes live, before the Kickstarter goes live. So we were lucky in the fact that we had we were at CES last year under the Snowbot name. So we already had a lot of people that were interested in the snowblower. Also, because the snowblower is something that no one else has right now. So the mm-hmm. fact that it's modular on top of that really helped things. So what we basically did was we drove all our advertising to a Facebook group so people could join a Facebook group. Now, we had about 6,000 followers when we started on our Facebook page, but the Facebook group now, just the launch group, has, I think, about 23,000 or so followers. And so really, that's just been, you know, very heavy internet uh, advertising to the right market. So, you know, people that already own an autonomous lawnmower is a great fit for either the lawnmower for Yarbo, the blower, or if they're in, you know, the snowboat region, obviously the snowblower. But yeah, that's just, that's been a lot of just hitting the right demographics and really fine tuning our, you know, just getting in front of the right personas for our marketing campaigns. And, and that's a constant thing, right? So that's what it was a month ago. It's it's definitely different this, you know, this month now that we're 30 days into the campaign or so. 
So, and we're just constantly refining. And you, you mentioned you, you have quite a long experience in marketing yourself and then in sales. So, yeah. so based on that and, and your own experience now with um, the, the Snowboat and Yarbo, what do you feel are the most common mistakes entrepreneurs make with their brands because I'm, sh- I'm sure obviously you have to have a great product that's you know it, it's not going to work long term especially if if you don't but like your brand and your name is an important part or at least i feel correct me if I, if, I, if i'm wrong of your marketing yeah no i i agree with you 100 percent. and as far as the mistakes I'm big on, I guess, challenges, maybe not mistakes, but one of the challenges mm, we obviously yeah. caught ourselves in was the Snowbot, right? Had we stuck with that, we could have then come up with you know, multiple names to describe each one of our attachments and each one of our products. But really, I think it's always best to try and keep it as simple as possible. One name, something that's memorable, and don't be afraid to ever change. Uh, you know, it, it was a mm. very difficult decision internally because all we've known is the snowbot for the last five, six years, you know, to let that go and let go of all the domain history and all of that. Yeah, we can do redirects and things like that, but we're doing, you know, it's a complete rebrand, but mm. we really believed in it and, uh, and it, it absolutely paid off in the end. But that's not to say that people internally in the company were very nervous about going through a full rebrand because even just being at CES last year in the exposure we got, you know, it's okay. Well, you know, what, What's going to happen? Because we're if we don't manage it correctly, we're essentially starting from scratch, right? Mm-hmm. So we made sure we did press releases when we rebranded. You know that was that was really important. We agonized over color schemes and things like that, which in a way I will say I know designers might maybe um, not agree with me, but um, but I think we were putting too much emphasis on things like that the color that things, you know, maybe the vibe that that puts off with customers and things like that. And I think a lot of that is in the tone of the branding and the tone of the marketing, right? The Mm -hmm. wording more so than maybe the colors. Uh, Obviously you don't want something that just looks ugly. Right. But, um, yeah, but from a branding standpoint, I would just say, don't, don't be a, keep it simple, but don't be afraid to rebrand. If you feel like your branding is not working right now, your branding is everything. So again, the same thing from the, the premium domain name, that was a pretty good investment for us, but that's our name. That means everything. If you're going to invest in anything, invest in your name because that's your reputation. That's everything that follows. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And actually you raise a very interesting point. I had an IT company before I got into naming and domains. And so I've been on the side of like, now I'm consulting entrepreneurs about their brand and their name and their domain. Before that, I was selling software and websites. And and, and so I've been on that end where you can see people losing themselves and like just going completely crazy over what color is whatever button. And, uh, you know, like you said, the color scheme, especially when nowadays you have like so many social networks, so many devices, day, night mode, whatever. So you're going to yeah. have to change colors anyway. So it, it's literally like if, if you, I think that's a very good advice to just stick to something simple, even down to like the, the writing, the logo, everything has to, to be very basic and very open to different interpretations afterwards. And the same people that would like spend gazillions on different design companies for you know the website the the logo the whatever will be like yeah but that domain name is too expensive like put a dash there Co- or, correct you know correct. Yes. And, and and it's just crazy it's it just, is it's crazy. it is but i think on that on in that respect i think you i think people really have to give more credit to their name it seems like such common sense but a lot of times you're right people get i think sticker shock but in the end, this is what you're going to be known for, you know, mm. until if unless you have some reason to rebrand the company down the road, this is what you're going to be known for, for this foreseeable future. Right. And all the, the color schemes and the, the copywriting and all that stuff, that all follows it. Right. But mm. that uh, that name and making it simple. And believe me, we thought of, OK, let's maybe do Yarbo Inc. or the Yarbo mm. or something like that. And then we're like, you know what? It's not worth it. Like it's a compromise for when in the end, the domain was an investment, but com- but the return on investment, it, we probably can't even quantify. You know, it's that valuable. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And, and um, I feel you've done the right thing. And also in terms of image, you know, I'm, I actually like, even without knowing how long you've been in business and how long your 
you know, envisaging to stay in business, you look at somebody, you know, who's in, on Yarbo.com, that gives one impression. And somebody who is, you know, we are Yarbo.net, it's a very different impression without anything else said. Right. Like, 100%. Basically. Yep. No, I, I can't agree with you more. Yeah. And actually, my company previous to this, previous to the uh, dealership was an internet marketing. And we would have clients come to us the same way that wanted to change their names to .net just to save a few bucks and or put ink after their company. It was never worth it. It was never worth it. And then eventually they would get the .com later on and they would probably spend more money in redirects and you know trying to change everything back to the .com years later when they could have just purchased the premium version and mm. been done with it. That's the, the hard part there. It's very hard to put a value and quantify something that you don't have. And that's what I try to explain often to people because it's like you you literally could be losing and likely are, you know, our experience and not only in people who have already changed to a better name, but like you're doing it in reverse. It's like, how can you quantify how much money you're losing when, you know, those people are not reaching you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I never thought about it really at this scale, but it's almost like you're working backwards and more Mm -hmm. time that goes by, you're actually probably losing more money because it's only going to cost you more money to Mm rebrand the further down that rabbit hole you go, right? So if it's six months or a year from now, and then you realize, oh, I can finally, okay, I'll I'll break down and get the .com name or whatever it is, doesn't matter. By that point, the longer you wait, the more effort you're going to have to put into Mm rebranding. But again, even that said, I would tell people, don't be afraid to do it. And obviously there's bigger companies out there that have to multiple locations that have to, you know, redo their signs and everything like that. And again, if you pick the right name, it's still worth it. I, I, I'm a true believer in that for sure. Yeah, definitely. In our experience as well. One, well, probably another couple of questions. I'm not going to lie. It's the last one, but sure. I want to hear about that one. So most, most entrepreneurs nowadays are like literally people, when they start thinking, okay, I'm going to start a business, everybody's thinking I'm going to do something digital, something that where there's no physical product, there's less less uh, cost involved in, in starting, uh, less risk, et cetera, et cetera. And you went into like not just something physical, but like very, very technical as well. Um, and it's in an area as well that is not known for being like, fun and exciting and cool sure and you've managed to actually produce something that is like i've never thought of of a machine for picking up snow or leaves or cutting the grass as something that can be exciting and cool and fun and yours is thank you so how did you do that and was it like an accident was it intentional or how did that that was an intention from the beginning and uh i can't solely take credit for that the team behind Yarbo really, really believes in the product. They're technology enthusiasts and they, we kind of all follow the same belief in that we really want Yarbo to improve people's lives. We don't want it to be a machine, which again was why we don't have the Yarbo. We want it to be more of a companion, but we want it to be fun. You know, like the snowblower, you know, we were talking and we're like, you know what, Yarbo, if it can push snow, let's see how much it can tow. So we've towed boats with it that are four to 5,000 pounds. We have a few videos of Yarbo towing kids in the snow, you know, up a hill with it, you know, so they're, they're behind in the sled. So they don't have to climb up the hill. And someone wrote us actually a grandparent and said, oh, I want to use my Yarbo to tow my grandkids, you know, up the hill so they can go back down on the slide because we can't, you know, help them. And I'm like, oh, that, you know, that's really cool. But that's really been a goal for ours. It's, it really is a passion. So we love technology in general. But for Yarbo, we always wanted it to have like a fun, playful aspect to it. And I think that will come out more down the years, you know, in different revisions as well to be, again, more of a companion and less of a machine. I love the grandparents' the story there because that is the only thing I was thinking of. Because really, like you said, it's um, your mission at, at the very basis of it is to save people time. And like the only times where you could see uh, or you could think about uh, cleaning snow or picking up uh, leaves in the garden where it is fun is that one time in the year where the kids want to get involved. That's the only time where you say, okay, I'd rather do that with them, you know, myself. Otherwise, it's just a task that, you know, time. No, and and you know what? You're 100% correct. So I have a 
soon to be three-year-old in about two weeks. And then another little one on the way in three weeks. So he was out in the beginning of the summer helping me cut the lawn. So I brought out the regular lawnmower so that he had his bubble lawnmower that puts bubbles out when he pushes it. <laughs> that literally, le- and he was so excited. And that lasted for about five minutes. And he said, okay, mm-hmm. daddy, I'm going to take a break. You know, yeah. <laughs> and that's the last time he came out with me. So then I brought the Yarbo out and I let the Yarbo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now he's remote controlling the Yarbo. You know, he's he's just shy of three years old. He thinks it's the coolest thing in the world. But I would rather be, you know, on the playground with him doing things mm-hmm. like that. You know, the other impact that I that I think a lot of people lose sight of with the autonomous side of robots, especially like snow removal. So my parents and this is something that's kind of uh, popular here in New York. Right. A lot of people are the older generations, maybe 70, 80, they'll, they're, some of them will be called like snowbirds. And in the, in the wintertime, they'll go down to Florida and in the summertime, they'll come back up here. And it's not because Mm -hmm. they necessarily can't do the cold weather. They want to be up here for the grandkids and whatnot, but they can't do the snow. They, they, we don't have snow removal companies up here residentially where I am in Long Mm. Island. They, you know, they, they're nervous about slipping and falling or being stuck in their house. Mm. Really being able to do this, we've actually, There's obviously folks that are disabled for one reason or another that can't mow their own lawn, that can't remove the snow from their driveway themselves. But then there's, you know, elderly people that physically just can't do it anymore, but they still want to stay in their home. Mm. But the struggle to maintain it is not just a luxury. It it takes away their independence when they can't. So Mm -hmm. that's something we're really excited to see kind of evolve, you know, that if my parents want to go down to Florida, that's a choice, right? But it's not something they have to do kind of for their own health. Right. So we're, we're really looking forward to see how that impacts people's lives as well, you know, across the board. And that's not just us. That's any kind of autonomous technology that you can apply to life to make someone's mm. quality of life better. I'd love to be on the team that's doing your advertising. Honestly, it's like I can hear just so many wonderful adverts. Like before I heard about your company, if somebody had said, do you want to work on advertising for like, uh, you know, snow removal machine? I'd be like, nope. Yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> Boring. I know. Yeah. I know. And, and I was like, I have those you know, Nike do those adverts that are really like, you almost feel like some nostalgia and some, you know, those kind of family and memories and exciting, positive things. And I was like, yeah, you can do a lot of that. (laughs) It's really No, for sure. For sure. Really cool. And uh, I will say that's what kind of, um, and in the marketing, right? Any, we don't, we can do a better job of it ourselves, but anything that draws like, you know, an emotional reaction, right? So mm. that's why like spending more time with more time, just doing what you love. It could be a myriad of things, right? But having, having more time in general, I think, and more independence to do mm. what you want to do, especially with today being just so busy in general in life. You know, I'm, I really look forward to not just our product, autonomous products in general, just mm. being able to, to do that, just to let people have a better quality of life and enjoy life more and not having to do necessarily the mundane tasks they don't want to. If you enjoy cutting your own, by all means, keep at it, you know, but if you'd rather be doing something else, we'd like to give you that option. Yeah. And that's something I'd like to highlight actually, as um, like you make a very good example of something I feel is very important and more and more consumers expect that from brands. It's not like an option. It's like, if you don't have that they, you're not going to keep an audience for a long time. And that's being authentic and really, really true to, to, to your mission, having a mission to begin with. That's not just profit, but also being true to that. And, and in your case, that's very like from the beginning, you said, you, you know, we want people to have more time to, to be more independent and everything else that you talk works around that and fits with that very nicely. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and honestly, that came from two, like uh, I had two uncles that uh, had Parkinson's, so they could not mm. manage the yard on their own. And you see things like that. And the last thing someone should have to worry about is taking up with their lawn care, right? When it's difficult for them to walk or take care of themselves, you know what I mean? So it's, the impacts are really wide ranging, yeah. but, uh, but, and I, and I, like I said, I mean, the team behind Yarbo, it's really unique at least from what I've found over the years, to find a team that really gets it and really, mm-hmm. you know, has a common goal through and through. So from engineering to software to marketing, I'm very, very thankful on that side for the team behind Yarbo. But 
And that's another thing that's super important and very hard nowadays, like you say. So what's next? Last question. What's next for Yarbo? Sure. So uh, honestly, we have a very extensive roadmap of different modules for Yarbo. A few of them, right, just easy ones expanding on what we already have. So we've had a lot of requests for not just the front modules that switch out from Yarbo, but like people want to put a salt spreader a brine spreader. So you have like a salt spreader, which is a mm-hmm. granular spreader, right? To de-ice things. They also want to use that for the summertime to uh, put down like fertilizer and uh, weed killer and things like that to treat the lawn. We have aerators oh. and um, dethatchers, things that are more, again, yard oriented. But then we want to take it a step further. Like um, the Yarbo, I don't know if you saw, has a, a very big battery. So one of the things we have is a a power case that you can take the Yarbo battery out of and plug it into. And so you can power all of your electronics on the go. So we're trying to to really make Yarbo be as versatile as possible. That's a a very big thing. And the other thing that we're we're doing as well is a surveillance camera. So that basically a lot of people have alarms in their homes. But one of the things and cameras, but one of the problems with that is, and we've actually, this was from feedback from customers, They wanted a surveillance camera because if you have an alarm system in your house, when the window breaks, that's when you're notified that someone's Mm -hmm. now in your house, right? And it's a different kind of a panic, right? If you have a camera outside, you might be notified when they get to your doorbell camera, right? But now they're already on your property. Mm -hmm. With Yarbo in the future, it will be able to recognize you. It will be able to follow you around the yard. It could be towing maybe a trailer, right, that you're maybe gardening, gardening, putting things in. Or it can be going around doing surveillance. And when it recognizes someone that doesn't know, say, from Mm -hmm. a certain set of hours, it can notify you on the app. So Mm -hmm. this way you'll know that someone is in your yard that or on your property that shouldn't be at a certain time of night. And it's not necessarily for violent type things, but like around here, a lot of people, it's actually setting records. People are stealing catalytic converters and people <laughs> might, pet, might see them on video, but, but by the time they get out there, it's already been too late, so to mm. speak. So Yarbo can actually be controlling, uh, rather patrolling your yard and notifying you of things like that. So, I mean, in the future, again, it's very still yard focused, but we really want to make it more, again, of a, a companion type setup. And we, uh, I mean, the, the demand has been crazy. And that really priority, priority wise is going to be user driven. We're really big into taking surveys engaging with our Facebook group and kind of seeing where people want to take the Yarbo next. Because at the end of the day, kind of being passionate about technology, we really want our audience to drive the Mm. the roadmap for Yarbo. Um, Internally, we have our own, so to speak, roadmap, but it's not set in stone. Really, our users Mm -hmm. are going to try and, you know, drive that path or steer it, I should say. That's again something I think could be a takeaway for our audience. That the, I mean, it's really a great way to to develop, not be fixed on, you know, that's what we decided to do. That's what we're doing, but follow what your audience is suggesting and looking for. And that's something I feel a lot of people get wrong as well, where they at some point forget that as well as they know their product, they're oftentimes not their own audience. And so at some point you have to just let go and say, okay, maybe you thought that will go this way or that way, but you know, that's what the audience wants. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And you're right. I think time and almost becoming complacent is like Mm -hmm. a silent enemy, so to speak, of any company, especially as you get bigger to kind of lose sight of what the customer wants. Luckily, a lot of people at Yarbo, a lot of the team are actual customers as well. So Mm -hmm. we are using it for our own yard care. We are using it for our own snow removal. Like we've had, you know, our own struggles, obviously doing it through traditional snowblower methods and things like that. Always want to engage our audience. That's, uh, in fact, I don't know if you had known this from Snowbot, but we had actually shipped out a hundred beta units to customers. And part of that setup was that they bought a beta unit for about $2,000. They would test it, provide us feedback. And this was all across North America and parts of Europe. And through that feedback, we improved the Snowbot to what was going to be the Snowbot S1 Pro before we were branded. So really what you're seeing in the Yarbo S1 is just kind of an evolution of what our beta testers uh, had experienced and the challenges they were kind of put against and the feedback they gave us. And so as part of a thank you, they're all getting a Yarbo 
S1 for free. And again, for us, that's critical information because without mm. the community being engaged firsthand and telling us, hey, you know what? The Yorba is getting stuck here, right? In heavy, wet mm. snow, the single stage snowblower is not doing it. We need a two, you know, we need a two stage or working hand in hand to find a solution. That really helped the product evolve to where it is today. I love that. So, yeah, that's a really great way to do things. And I hope there's more and more companies doing that. And again, that's not, I might be wrong, but I don't know many companies that, like, I, obviously, digital web-based companies do that a lot where they, you know, they'll send you something or they ask you about something to a point where people are actually even ignoring that now. But Right. But yeah, businesses that have especially, you know, more expensive to develop and produce products rarely go that far into getting feedback from their users and over time. Uh, yeah. And I mean, it's an investment, but in a way it's an investment in R&D, right? And in marketing, right? Because you Absolutely. want to know what your market needs. And uh, from an R&D standpoint, you could save a lot of time, you know, identifying real world issues before they before you ship and now realize we have to wait for a version two, right? Great. Well, that's been that's been super interesting for me. I feel it will be for our audience as well. Thank you. And um, yeah, looking forward to how this all develops and good luck to you with thank the little ones. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Smart Branding Podcast. Feel free to visit smartbranding.com for more information and reach out if you have any suggestions, questions, ideas, or just want to learn more about how a good domain name strategy can help you build a strong and successful brand. See you next time.